Good afternoon. We'll, we'll go ahead and get started and convene our afternoon panel. Um, our topic for this panel is going to be investor state awards in the courts. And since I see a number of students, some of whom may not have had uh, Professor Coe for international arbitration, I wanted to draw a distinction. You know, this morning we were largely talking about um, international arbitration in the abstract or international arbitration and uh, its relationship to courts and judges, both in the United States and abroad. We we're also talking about the restatement and defining terms of international arbitration. What we're, what we're looking at now, in many ways, is, is, the, is the back end process of arbitration, where you're hopefully representing a client and you've won, and now you want to see it paid. Of course, many of these cases will settle, but not all circumstances will they. And thus, you'll have to seek the aid of a court uh, in hopes of enforcing an arbitral award. Another distinction we should draw is the fact that um, enforcement, to the extent it's the same, comes at least in two types. One is traditional international commercial arbitration involving two businesses. What we're talking about here is what is known as investor state arbitration, which means that there is a treaty between two countries, the United States and Ecuador, for instance, which gives a U.S. investor in Ecuador, for instance, the possibility of bringing suit against uh, the government of Ecuador to recover uh, for things like expropriation, lack of fair and equitable treatment, um, uh, denial of justice, these sorts of things. And should an arbitral tribunal find in favor of the investor, you would then have a, an award which would need to be converted uh, to an enforceable judgment by a court either in the United States or abroad. With that as background, we are very privileged today to have both leading practitioners and scholars in the area of international arbitration, both investor state and international commercial arbitration. We'll hear first today from Abby Cohen Smutney, who is a partner and co-head of White and in Cases International Arbitration Practice Group, uh, and as well the Public International Law Practice Group. Um, she is one of the leading uh, international, arbitrator, uh, international arbitrator councils in the world, and also one of the leading practitioners in this area. And it'll be very interesting to hear her remarks from a, I think, somewhat practical perspective as to someone who has to advise clients on a daily basis whether or not the law is both efficient and fair as well as just. After that, we'll hear from Professor Jared Wong from McGeorge Law School. Uh, he's going to talk about a recent Supreme Court decision which has been referenced earlier today as the case of BG versus Argentina which involves sort of two questions. One, who decides whether or not uh, a treaty says what, a, what you think a treaty says, arbitrators or courts. And two, what standards should be applied in making that determination. And I think he's going to challenge uh, the decision of the court and point to some opportunities for further clarification in this debate uh, as to between who arbitrates and what is the standard. And batting cleanup will be uh, Andrea Bjorklund, who is a professor at McGill University, formerly at UC Davis. Um, and I think she's going to also talk about uh, BG versus Argentina, but try to expand the dialogue uh, a little bit beyond that uh, to focus on some of the things that were discussed uh, earlier today. As in earlier panels, if there are questions during the presentations, feel free to fill out a card and pass them up. We can um, we sort of interrupt and have an intervention at that time if the, if, the, if the card is relevant to the comment. Otherwise, we will do an open question and answer ses session towards the end where we'll take audience questions and I will repeat them for the, for the cameras and for posterity. Uh, and so without further ado, let me introduce Abby cohen Smutney and say thank you for joining us. And we look forward to hearing what it's like in the real world of okay. investor state arbitration. Thank you very much. <clears throat> and I want to just uh, repeat that it's my pleasure to be here and I'm very grateful to have been invited. Um, let me start by just briefly explaining what is ICSID, what is ICSID Convention. Um, ICSID is an acronym. It stands for the International Center for the Settlement of Investment Disputes. It's an international organization. It itself is, uh, was created by a treaty called the, the ICSID Convention. It's a member of the World Bank Group. It is the forum in which probably most, I, I, I say probably because uh, it, there are so many other uh, um, uh, uh, types of arbitration now <clears throat> for investor state, there are unsatural rules arbitration in particular, but ICSID arbitration is almost certainly where the majority of investor state arbitrations take place, uh, administered by ICSID. Um, 
the ICSID convention is established through ICSID a treaty-based framework for the conduct of arbitrations that is entirely self-contained and removed from national court systems. So we were hearing this morning so much about the, the role of courts, the, 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 the whole idea of ICSID is that it should exist and function without national courts. Entirely self-contained is, is the idea here. And so what we're going to talk about is to what extent is that really the case when you get to the end uh, of the process. Um, the self-contained aspect of, of ICSID extends also to enforcement of awards in principle. Um, rather than rely on the New York Convention, which was already in exist existence when the ICSID Convention was um, uh, was negotiated and concluded. That was in 1965. The New York Convention had already existed at that time, and so the framers of the convention, that is to say the ICSID Convention, made a deliberate decision not to have an ICSID award be enforceable in national courts in accordance with the New York Convention, but rather have a separate regime. That's, that was the idea. And the mechanism, the framework for enforcement of ICSID conventions is, uh, awards is set forth in Articles 15, 53 through 55 of the convention. This is long. I've just pulled up for you the text of Article 54, <clears throat> which is the mechanism of enforcement envisioned by the ICSID convention. But, but let me just briefly give you the full framework, which starts with Article 53 of the convention, which I don't have the text for you, but I want to just say briefly. Article 53 states that awards, ICSID awards, are binding on the parties to the dispute, not very remarkable or surprising. And, but what's important to appreciate is that because it is a treaty and mo all investor state cases are going to have a state party on the one side and a private party on the other side, the state party that is agreeing to be bound by an ICSID uh, award now has a treaty obligation to be to, to honor the award. So it's not just contractual, they have a treaty obligation to be bound by the award. Um, this was considered to be an imbalance by the, conven the convention drafters, and it was important to have a mechanism also uh, to be able to enforce against a private party. In principle, uh, it's possible, and there are a few historic examples, uh, of a, a state bringing a case against uh, a foreign investor. So it's not always the case, although it is in the vast majority of circumstances, it's not always the case that the state is the, the, the respondent. Uh, and uh, when the ICSID Convention was originally uh, drafted, <coughs> this was in the days before in modern investment treaties were, um, uh, were around even. They were, well, the idea was that there would be contracts in which, for example, a concession would be given to a foreign investor and the, con the, the concession contract would have uh, a, an agreement to submit disputes to ICSID arbitration. So as originally envisioned, it was equally possible that the state might have a claim against the concessionaire. So it was envisioned in that way p possible that you have to have a mechanism to enforce against a private party and to enforce against a private party that had to be a way to go into a national court. Uh, interestingly, at the time, a lot of the convention history suggests that the drafters at that time just assumed that states would, of course, honor their treaty obligations and there would not be a need to have a, 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 force, a forcible execution against the state. But um, uh, the, the, the world progresses, and in fact, it is an issue. Uh, mm -hmm. There are states that don't uh, readily comply, and enforcement against states has been necessary. Um, so the, Article 54, I'll talk to uh, again about it in a moment, but let me just it's sandwich by, so Article 53, the idea that the, the, the party, the state is bound uh, to comply with the award, and Article 55 reflects the limits of the enforcement mechanism, and that is the ICSID Convention does not extend to immunities of state assets. So when you think about uh, enforcing uh, an award, we're talking about well, ca can I attach some property and, and force payment? And the ICSID Convention in Article 55 makes clear the ICSID Convention is not, has nothing to say, does not derogate from, 
any of the rules on uh, immunities uh, of, state, uh, of state assets. So ICSA convention enforcement does not extend to the process of attaching assets of a state. Those are subject to whatever the laws are in the relevant jurisdiction for immunities of, of state assets. So looking at the mechanism that Article 54 is, um, it envisions a very simple system. It envisions, well, first it confirms that the parties, that, that each contracting state, and let me clarify what this means here. We're now not talking about the parties to the dispute. We're talking about every state that is a party to the ICSA Convention. So whatever the number is now, well over 140 states, um, every state party to the ICSA Convention has a treaty obligation under Article 54 to recognize an award pursuant to the Convention, to recognize an ICSID award, and to enforce, and you're looking at the language there, the pecuniary obligations imposed by the award um, as if it's a final judgment of the state. Um, I'll come back to the nuance that that uh, refers to, and if you look at, that's in the first section, and then the second section is basically setting forth the notion that a party seeking recognition or enforcement need only, although it doesn't use the word only, the idea is that you furnish a, you furnish a copy, a certification, a certified copy of the award, you furnish it to a competent authority, not necessarily a court, a court or other authority, you furnish a copy of the award, and that was the way to enforce uh, the, uh, the or, or seek recognition of the award. So this is intended to be a very simple regime. The fact that it doesn't have to be a court, you could see from the language of Article 54 itself, the convention envisions that you would furnish a copy to either a, a, a competent court or other authority, an authority that's designated by that state party. So, and I, I will tell you that in fact, although the majority of state parties to the ICSA convention designate a court, uh, not all of them do. Some of them designate uh, an, an agency of, of the state, sometimes a ministry of finance or a ministry of foreign affairs. So the idea here is truly intended to be that if you want to enforce an ICSID award, all you should have to do is bring a certified copy of it to the competent authority, and that's it. That's all you should have to, have to do. So what happens in, in practice? Well, I thought that we would focus on what happens in the United States, uh, just to keep it, uh, keep it somewhat uh, simple. Uh, and, and in fact, most of the enforcement efforts have been in the United States for one reason or another. This is the U.S. Uh, implementing statute. So first let me say that in the United, what did, what did the United States do? The ICSA Convention envisions, as you just saw in Article 54, that each state party to the convention is going to designate a competent authority. The United States designated under the ICSA Convention the federal district courts. So that's the, the competence authority under uh, the treaty. And then the United States has implementing a uh, statute here, which is as indicated on the slide here. Um, and uh, one, one further thing to note ab uh, about this, and let me just, not to make you dizzy, but to just go back to Article 54 for a minute. If you look at, uh, let me get it right where it is, it's the, First, uh, 54 1, the second sentence. It, what, it, what it says is that for a contracting state with a federal constitution, and according to the ICSA Convention uh, legislative history, that was a sentence inserted uh, at the request of the United States. Um, federal constitution may enforce an award through federal courts and provide that such courts treat the award as if it were a final judgment of the court of a constituent state. So to treat in, in its federal courts to treat the ICSID award as, it's a, as if it's a final judgment of, of the state, of a constituent state. So uh, uh, that's what the convention allows, and that is what the United States did. No doubt, considering that the, a practical way of, of dealing with it. So just a few observations about Title 221650. Uh, it has uh, a number of, of aspects. First, the first uh, aspect, the first sentence of A, that the award, uh, 
uh, rendered pursuant to a convention creates a right arising under a treaty of the United States. Then, interestingly, the second sentence, the pecuniar pecuniary obligations imposed by the award shall be enforced and shall be given the same full faith and credit as if the award were a final judgment of a state court, basically. And then the third sentence, the Federal Arbitration Act shall not apply to enforcement of awards rendered pursuant to the convention. So a number of issues have arisen as a result of these um, various uh, uh, aspects that I thought I would just run through. We could spend a lot of time talking about what actually happens with some of the nuance here, but just in the interest of time, I'll just identify the issues for you and just give you an idea of some of the, the questions that the courts and parties have been struggling with a little bit. First uh, thing to point out is terminology and the challenging fluidity of the concepts of recognition, enforcement, and execution. And what exactly does that mean? And I can tell you that the word enforcement in particular has maybe multiple meanings or a sort of a fluid, a fluid uh, concept. And very briefly, I'll describe what I mean by that. Maybe one simple way to describe it, and here's one, one way to think uh, about it, although there are other uh, ways. Recognition, what does recognition mean? Recognition, one could say, is like confirmation, taking an arbitral award and recognizing it through the courts, that is, converting it to a judgment. Not doing anything more than that. Recognizing an award typically would mean we convert the award to a judgment. It's now been recognized by the domestic legal system. Enforcement, what does enforcement mean? Well, enforcement doesn't, to, to many people, enforcement means confirmation, getting the court to recognize. It's confusing, but it, it's true because of the fluidity of these words, you'll see discussion and sometimes parties will use the word enforcement, but what they're talking about is recognition and confirmation. And sometimes parties use the word enforcement and what they mean is attach assets that we understand to be execution, uh, execution against assets. But that fluidity of that word enforcement has created some confusion when you start reading cases. What exactly is being discussed needs to either be appreciated in context or you have to appreciate that whoever is speaking is confused themselves or they're talking past each other. That sometimes is what's uh, occurring. So practically, how, how do these issues come up? Well, then let, let's talk about non-pecuniary obligations, for, an, for example. It's not that often that an arbitral award will include non-pecuniary obligations, but in principle it's possible uh, and it does sometimes uh, occur. And what we see under both Article 54 of the, of the ICSID Convention itself and the U.S. implementing statute, there is to be non-pecuniary obligation is binding and it should be recognized but it's not to be enforced, or the, the obligation is not to enforce. The obligation of enforcement, as contrasted to the obligation to recognize as binding, is only as to pecuniary obligations. Why is that? How is a U.S. court, how is a court to enforce, and bear in mind it's usually a foreign sovereign, how is a U.S. court going to enforce a non-pecuniary ob obligation against another state? Well, I suppose we can think of some ways in which uh, it, it could, but bear in mind that the statute uh, in the U.S. has left some ambiguity about, uh, about this issue um, uh, because it says in the second sentence that pecuniary obligations shall be enforced. You, one can debate whether the first sentence, that the award creates a right arising under the treaty, suggests that you should be able to obtain a judgment recognizing non-pecuniary obligations, but that's very uh, unclear. Some commentators pointing to this issue raise the question, well, can you enforce a non-pecuniary obligation under the New York Convention? And uh, it's, an interesting, uh, it's an interesting question. Um, at least in the U.S., this 
this statute, 22 U.S.C. 1650, excludes New York Convention from applying to enforcement uh, of an ICSID award. The, the Federal Arbitration Act shall not apply to enforcement of awards, but could the Federal Arbitration Act apply to recognize a non-pecuniary obligation? These are some questions you see in the commentary. Maybe that violates the ICSID Convention because under the New York Convention there are, there are exceptions to enforceability. You have a variety of, uh, uh, of defenses to enforcement under the New York Convention, but under the ICSID Convention, the obligation is to enforce without exception. And so it would, there would be some difficulty uh, there. Um, this raises a question, and maybe this will be the last one I have time to talk about, but the non-pecuniary obligations raises a question about provisional measures. We see in U.S. Uh, in, in U.S. practice before courts and in discussions under the Federal Arbitration Act that there is there are some circumstances in which U.S. courts are willing to enforce an interim or provisional order uh, of a tribunal in in various uh, circumstances. And so, an interesting question is: Well, could you ever enforce a provisional measure that you get from an ICSID uh, arbitral um, an ICSID arbitration? Uh, and, and the answer is, well, it's probably, probably not, but one could have some debate about uh, that. Um, Article 54 of the ICSID Convention refers only to final awards, not interim uh, awards, and so, or, or provisional measures, but then there's something else in the ICSID Convention that's referred to, it's Article 26, which requires, going back to that absolutely, uh, um, self-contained aspect of ICSID arbitration. Once you agree to ICSID arbitration under Article 26, it's the exclusive remedy. So that's been interpreted as meaning you cannot go to a court and get enforcement of your uh, provisional measure. Um, so apart from the non-pecuniary confusion, can you even get that enforced? Uh, you have the exclusion, even if you were to think about that under the New York Convention, uh, you have Article 26, which is uh, ex exit arbitration is to be exclusive. Um, I would say a little bit more about the uncertainty of the procedure that is uh, uh, to be followed about enforcement of an exit award. And I'm mindful of the time, so I'm just going to summarize very quickly what those questions are, and then we'll, we'll have to move on. Um, what do I mean by um, uncertain procedure? <clears throat> well, there's questions about whether or not an application to enforce an ICSID award can be ex parte or whether or not it needs to be a full action. This is significant if you're trying to enforce against a sovereign because of the Foreign Sovereign Immunities Act. What it means to serve a sovereign is a very burdensome, time-consuming issue. So the ability to make an, an ex parte application to enforce your ICSID award is critical. And the majority, but not all, um, interestingly, the majority, but not all, uh, of U.S. federal courts have held that an ex parte action is sufficient. Um, there's some confusion about venue, uh, that re whether it has to be in the District of Columbia if you're uh, having a, an enforcement action against the, uh, the, a foreign sovereign. The Eastern District of Virginia recently uh, dismissed a case for improper venue when a party was seeking confirmation of an ICSID award, sent them to the District of Columbia, although there are quite a number of cases before the Southern District of New York. There are some interesting questions that the District Court in D.C. and the District Court in New York don't agree on as to whether or not we incorporate state law when we are seeking to enforce ICSID awards. Again, going back to the notion of what does it mean to enforce, whether that encompasses the notion of execution against assets, because if you've studied federal procedure, you know that in order to execute a judgment, uh, the federal courts refer to the state court law, I mean the state law of, of that forum. So should one do that for an ICSID as, uh, as well? There's some inconsistencies in the, in the judicial decisions on that. Uh, and very quickly, the last couple of points, full faith and credit. Uh, you will have noticed under 22 U.S.C. that statute, a reference to the fact that uh, the ICSID award should be treated as if they're given full faith and credit. Some commentators have suggested that this means that, in fact, there are exceptions because full faith and credit in U.S. 
law doesn't mean in every circumstance really full faith and credit, but if you look at the statute, I would say that the obligations even under the U.S. statute is first that they shall enforce and then separately and give full faith and credit. So I think that's not really an issue. Um, and then finally, uh, I would say the most interesting additional development is that there was recently a case in which a party assigned, that is to say sold, their ICSID award um, to another party. They had difficulty collecting. This was Argentina. Argentina was not paying voluntarily, and so this was an investment treaty arbitration. Assigned the award to basically a fund, an investment fund, and the question is can the fund go and enforce the exit award against Argentina, and the Southern District of New York said, I no problem, no, we see no problem with that. And this was a very controversial decision for countries like Argentina because there's something very special in the country's minds about these investment treaty protections that they extend. They extend them very specially to covered nationals, and so the feeling is that this obligation runs to a covered national, and the notion that the covered national can take the exit award and sell it to some vulture fund who then enforces it, that was a, a very controversial decision. But from the point of view of U.S. law, there was nothing particularly remarkable about it because judgments can be assigned. So with that, I will end. Thank you very and, much. And uh, we'll move on. Thank you. So thank you, Jack, Trey, the students of the Pepperdine Law Review uh, for organizing this conference uh, and hosting us in this gorgeous setting. It's a real pleasure to be here. Let me start by giving you an overview of kind of where I'm headed uh, with the talk, and then I can dive into the specifics. Right? Um, I'm obviously talking about BG Group versus Argentina. Uh, it's the first decision by the Supreme Court on the standard of review of an investment treaty award under the FAA and uh, New York Convention. The court there applied the intent of the party's framework developed as a matter of domestic law under first options and house them to arbitrability gateway questions. The majority decided that the relevant issue um, was a procedural question of arbitrability and that therefore deference was owed to the arbitrators in reviewing the award. I believe that the uh, that that was the correct result, but, the, uh, but that it was expressed with the incorrect rationale. I would actually go beyond uh, where the majority went. Uh, quite apart from the inherently flawed reliance on intent, I think the framework ignores to its detriment the international dimensions of the problem. So I say instead, let's jettison the gateway arbitrability framework uh, and just simply accord arbitrators substantial deference period. Uh, in these kinds of settings. Now, I will acknowledge that this is uh, a minority position, and I suspect at odds uh, with where Alan stands, uh, which is an unenviable position, and almost certainly a foolish one, uh, unless you're George, of course. Um, but I will take, well, I guess being sandwiched uh, in this investment uh, group, um, perhaps I feel a little bit more protected, so I'm going to take a deep breath and then dive in. If I may, more for the purposes of the larger audience uh, than the uh, first row and panelists, uh, I will summarize the BG Group Argentina uh, facts um, really quickly. So in BG Group, a British investor had brought a claim under UNCITRAL rules under the UK-Argentina Bilateral Investment Treaty against Argentina with the parties designating uh, DC as the seat of arbitration uh, because of a dispute that arose between uh, the British investor in Argentina and Argentina. Now, Argentina argued that the arbitrators lacked jurisdiction uh, because the bid required parties to submit the dispute to Argentinian courts for 18 months or until a result uh, came down from the Argentinian courts before they were allowed to file an arbitral claim and BG Group did not do that. It proceeded um, to arbitration directly. The arbitrator sided with uh, BG Group, however, and held that Argentina had waived the requirement, the local litigation requirement, through its conduct, namely by restricting access to its own courts um, under its emergency laws, and went on to decide against Argentina on the merits. 
Um, in, before the DC court, Argentina moved to vacate the award on the ground that arbitrators had exceeded their powers. And so the question then was, do we review this, does the court review this de novo or with deference? What does the majority do? Uh, as I mentioned before, it, um, it basically adopts right, the framework that it had set up under first options, which it elaborated under Hausam. The question for the court, for the majority, um, well, actually for, for both, because the framework um, was common right, to both, to, to all members of the court. They just came to a different decision on kind of where it lands. The question was who decides arbitrability? Um, first option tells us that this inquiry is rather in arcane so that parties cannot be presumed to arbitrate unless the evidence is clear, i.e. courts uh, review de novo as a general matter, right? Hausam refined it, or backpedal, depending on how you want to view it, uh, and say, no, not, not really. We kind of have to divide these kind of questions of arbitrability into two, two categories. There are gateway questions of arbitrability, those narrow circumstances where contracting parties have likely expected a court to have decided the gateway matter. For example, did the parties even sign an agreement um, to begin with? Right. And then there are matters of procedural arbitrability, other kinds of circumstances where parties would likely expect an arbitrator to decide the gateway matter, um, like statute of limitations or other procedural uh, bars um, to filing a claim. Right. Um, and so that kind of is the framework that the court ends up depending uh, in BG Group, uh, with the majority reaching the decision that uh, the local litigation requirement was in fact a procedural question of arbitrability and therefore one for the arbitrators to decide. Therefore, the court has to review this with deference. Uh, the dissent decided um, instead that it was a condition to uh, consent to arbitration and therefore effectively a gateway question of arbitrability and therefore this was a question Right, that the uh, court could review de novo. Um, I have various problems with the framework itself, which is the focus of my talk. Um, for one, I think it, there is an unreliable reliance on intent. Uh, and I've addressed that in a separate article in uh, the Florida State University Law Review, but, um, but very quickly, and I won't go into detail. Uh, I think it's a non-starter because um, Right. There is no intent here uh, in most cases. The agreement is silent and the parties just have not applied their mind to the rather arcane question. Um, and then the problem with referring to intent, right, is th what breed of intent are we talking about? Intent versus with regard to the terms or intent to be bound, intent with regard to the substance or intent with regard to process. Um, Ellen might say, we don't need to look at intent at all, right? These are questions that we can resolve by asking uh, what is the bargain that the parties will reach hypothetically had they applied their minds to it ex ante. But even so, I think the, it's a lousy test because of the elasticity of the procedural versus gateway divide. Right? So for example, um, in the BG group itself, the majority thought that it was an, a procedural question of arbitrability because the local litigation requirement only determine when arbitration began as opposed to whether the parties uh, had an arbitration agreement. Right? The dissent, however, saw this as a gateway issue because the consent to arbitration was in fact conditioned on the local litigation requirement. Um, I think that right, the framework, the use of that framework um, is not only an app, it's just compounded by ignoring the international dimensions of the problem. Um, so in a domestic context, right, in the absence of the arbitration agreement, the parties would be free to litigate the issue before the court. Right? And so in that context, it makes sense to think that a court will have jurisdiction over or should uh, be able to consider the substantive question of arbitrability or that the parties would have intended for the court to address substantive questions of arbitrability because in the absence of the arbitration agreement, they would have been free to proceed to the court in any event, right? That's not true, right, in the international investment context, right? There's no reason to think, right, that the states involved here, um, 
Argentina and the UK would have intended for a third party uh, state court to decide either gateway or substantive questions of arbitrability, even if the arbitration agreement does not exist. Right? Um, and then I would also uh, point to competence, competence uh, principles very generally, um, including in the answer trial rules themselves, right, which provides that the arbitral tribunal shall have the power to rule in its own jurisdiction. We heard from George earlier this morning that these are so common uh, so as to be meaningless in effect. Um, and I think I will concede that, but I believe that the effect is cumulative. Right? We look at this competence, competence principle, we look at the fact that states could not have intended a third party court uh, to address these questions, um, and that the, the structure of the bit uh, itself, re the, the entire purpose behind having that bit was to move the dispute between an investor and the state right, into arbitration. Right? The historical purposes behind having the ISDS provision in the bit right, was to avoid diplomatic protection. So when you take all of that in conjunction, I mean, I, I think, right, even if you were to use the court's framework, you would say that the most efficient outcome here, right, that what the parties must have intended, right, was for deference to be given uh, to the uh, decision of the arbitrators where they have decided that question. Um, going back to competence, competence, really quickly, I mean, I guess the question is, even if we say that competence, competence is simply a question of timing, which doesn't exclude a court from looking at that question, um, I think there's still a question as to, well, what is the effect when the court considers the question after an arbitrator has looked at it? Right? Uh, and, and if the answer to that question is, well, surely some deference must be given, right? given everything else that I've just talked about, um, then that's the question that we, we need to answer. Right? What's the consequence of um, the court looking at this question after the arbitrators have had um, a go at it? Um, I, I think the, the primary objection I, you know, to kind of the position I'm advancing is, well, the, in picking answer trial, um, arbitration, right, uh, and therefore subscribing to the New York Convention. The New York Convention allows domestic law to control the vacator or the annulment of awards. It's silent on that question, right? So one might argue that, in fact, by picking, right, ancestral arbitration rather than, say, exit arbitration, that, in fact, the intention of the parties was to allow courts to review um, the, the award de novo. Um, my view, though, I, I, I think is that the better view, given um, all the other points that I've already mentioned, right, is that, in fact, it, the most efficient outcome here, had the parties actually considered it, surely uh, we would say right, that um, they had intended for this dispute to be finally resolved by arbitration, so, uh, so that rather for a court to review this simply de novo, they, they must take into account what the arbitrators have uh, decided. Um, just very finally though, what are the consequences of this? Well, some would argue that what this means is there will, may well be a lot of satellite litigation surrounding right, whether the courts or the arbitrators have authority uh, to review and what the standards are, and that therefore that will dissuade um, parties from picking a US city as the seat of arbitration. Um, that's a possible consequence. Although the truth is, right, the majority of investment disputes are still resolved under the auspices of exit, right? And, and that is a self-contained system, as Abby has told us, uh, which means that courts will not touch it at all, uh, save for enforcement in, in un rather unusual circumstances, not in the circumstances uh, that we've just uh, examined. So perhaps the consequences uh, aren't all that great at the end of the day. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, uh, I'd too like to extend my appreciation to Jack and to Trey and to Tom and Catherine and the other students for having made us uh, so welcome here. I think your challenge is going to be to get rid of us. Um, we might stay for a while. 
so this morning, Tom Stepanowicz mentioned the polyphonic conversation that arbitration scholars have with each other. Um, and I fear that for the past uh, even even few hours, we've been having a, something of a stereophonic conversation about BG Group. And I'm about to add my voice to that discussion. Uh, so I'll try not to be uh, too repetitive about what has gone before. Um, I agree with Jared about many things that he said, although my bottom line would be the opposite. Um, and I'll explain uh, that as I go uh, along. Uh, in BG Group, the Supreme Court first likened the investment treaty between the United Kingdom and Argentina to a contract and interpreted it accordingly. The court said, we will initially treat the document before us as if it were an ordinary contract between private parties. You could have heard a collective gasp from international law scholars around the country. Treaties are not ordinary contracts. How could they mix up those concepts? Nowhere in the BG Group decision is there any reference to the Vienna Convention on the Law of Treaties. International lawyers invoke the Vienna Convention as a mantra. Most of us could cite it in our sleep. Is it really the talisman that we would like? Certainly, it can be used, uh, like many standards of review or canons of construction, as boilerplate. And indeed, the Vienna Convention on the Law of Treaties is cut and pasted and included in every WTO panel and appellate body decision. Uh, do those tribunals conscientiously apply it? Certainly, there's a body of literature that suggests they do not, um, but they have it there in the same way that in any U.S. court decision having to do with administrative law, one has sees a reference to Chevron. You can cut and paste it from one brief to the other. Now, U.S. courts, it's fair to say, just have no interest in the Vienna Convention. It doesn't come up. Um, this is curious given that the U.S. government accepts the Vienna Convention on the Law of Treaties as customary international law, even though the United States has not ratified it. Um, I read an interesting 2007 note in the Yale Law Journal which says that treaty interpretation is under-theorized. Now, this is somewhat amusing given the voluminous literature on the Vienna Convention on the Law of Treaties and treaty interpretation as an international law matter. We could all start now and we would not finish by you know, the end of the summer reading everything there is to know about treaty interpretation in international law. But it's true that as a U.S. law matter, the treaty interpretation, visa, as, as opposed to uh, uh, contract interpretation or statutory interpretation, is indeed under-theorized. Um, uh, but as, as to how treaties are interpreted by almost every other body besides a U.S. court, there is quite a lot of literature on that point. But to get back to our question, does this really matter? Does the Vienna Convention on the Law of Treaties really direct that treaties be interpreted in a manner that is different from contract interpretation? My friend Alan Rao and I have spent some hours discussing this question, and we haven't uh, resolved it yet. We, we hope to come to sufficient agreement or sufficiently harmonious disagreement uh, to meld our drafts uh, for the Pepperdine Law Review uh, uh, article that comes out of this symposium. And our common ground may indeed be that the rules of interpretation don't matter nearly as much as the identity and background of those who are doing the interpreting. Uh, but I, I don't want to get too far ahead of ourselves, uh, Alan. Um, so first, um, I, I too will discuss in just a little bit more detail the decision of BG Group. I'll try not to repeat too much of what Jared has said. Second, I'll lay out the interpretive provisions of the Vienna Convention on the Law of Treaties and offer a few observations about where the, these might differ from contract interpretation, even if those are differences of degree rather than of kind. And then third, I'll discuss how, the difference, uh, how this difference in approach could have affected the process of decision making in BG Group. Um, so after stating that it would approach the treaty as a contract, the, the court went on to state, the majority in BG Group said, were that so, that is to say, were the treaty an ordinary contract, uh, we conclude the matter would be for the arbitrators. 
We then ask whether the fact that the document in question is a treaty makes a crucial difference, critical difference. We conclude that it does not. This relaxed assumption, treating the treaty as a treaty, at least insofar as the court was capable of doing that, was not demonstrably better. The court interpreted the treaty in light of US arbitration law and applied the same presumptions it would have applied to an ordinary contract to arbitrate. So because the court viewed the requirement of the 18-month resort to local remedies rule as a procedural step, like the similar requirements seen in the Howsam case, the court viewed the question as one of admissibility entrusted to the arbitrators for determination. And let me be clear here, I don't disagree with the outcome, but I query the approach. Like Jared, I ask, why would the treaty and let me emphasize that here I believe the majority was in fact talking about the treaty between Argentina and BG Group uh, 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 about, uh, I'm sorry, it was not talking about the contract between Argentina and BG Group to arbitrate the dispute, but about the investment treaty itself, the agreement between the United Kingdom and Argentina. Why would that treaty be interpreted in light of US arbitration law? When the United Kingdom and Argentina concluded the treaty, they had no idea that it would ever be interpreted in light of US arbitration law and no reason to think particularly that it would be. Um, so they had no idea that the presumptions, the Howsam presumption would be applied to their bilateral uh, investment treaty or to the rather um, sparse investor state dispute settlement provisions in it. Um, the dissent, on the other hand, actually emphasized the fact that a treaty is different from a contract. Uh, yet after acknowledging that point, the dissent focused almost exclusively on the subsidiary contract, the contract between BG Group and Argentina about arbitrating. Yet it's curious the way that the dissent uh, uh, looked at that uh, subsidiary contract because they spent a great deal of time focusing on the sovereign nature of Argentina and the likelihood or lack thereof that Argentina would have agreed to arbitrate, would have given its consent to arbitrate unless the investor had sought relief in local courts for 18 months. Um, the dissent emphasized the intent of the parties and suggests that Argentina's intent was that there would be no agreement to arbitrate absent this 18 month local remedies period. Nowhere is there any reference to the UK's intent about negotiating the treaty, right? The shared intent of the treaty partners about what they expected. Um, and there's certainly no reference to BG Group's intent in commencing the uh, arbitration. Um, uh, and, and BG Group's intent on trying to uh, establish the uh, agreement to uh, arbitrate. Um, now, the dissent then referred to the possibility in analogizing to the local remedies rule that should resort to local remedies be futile, it might be possible to conclude that Argentina would be stopped from denying the existence of an agreement to arbitrate, um, effectively that Argentina couldn't stymie the formation of an arbitral agreement by refusing access to local courts. Uh, but I believe that in the course of their discussion, the dissent too ignored the fact that the treaty was concluded between two sovereign states for the benefit of the investors, uh, focusing almost entirely on Argentina's intent. So the dissent doesn't really focus on the treaty as a frame for the contract that might or might not have been formed between the investor and the host state. Um, now to turn to the, the Vienna Convention uh, itself, uh, Article 31 says that treaties must be interpreted in good faith in accordance with the ordinary meaning to be given to the terms of the treaty in their context and in the light of its object and purpose. So there are three pieces here, four if you look at good faith, which is not uh, unimportant. There's a focus on objectivity, on the ordinary meaning of the treaty itself. There's a focus on context. Context is viewed quite broadly, uh, but the ordinary terms must be read in light of the treaty as a whole and even possibly in light of other uh, relevant materials. And then there's a teleological uh, perspective in light of the object and purpose of the treaty. Uh, for time purposes, I won't elaborate on the rest of Article 31 except to say that it acknowledges the law-making role of the state's party to the treaty. 
uh, in terms of their ability to engage in subsequent agreements about the treaty, subsequent practice about the treaty, and that it also provides that the treaty should be interpreted in light of international law more generally. How is this different from contract interpretation? I have a few kind of preliminary observations. Um, first, none of these three steps, none of these three uh, uh, touchstones, ordinary meaning, context, in light of object and purpose, have priority. They are supposed to be applied holistically. Um, second, note that there is no reference to intent in the Vienna Convention. I didn't count, and Jared mentioned this too, um, in BG group, both the majority and the dissent raised the question of intent on, I, th I think, more than a dozen occasions. Um, the Vienna Convention deliberately attempted to emphasize the objective nature of the agreement. Intent is relevant only as reflected in the treaty or maybe in some of the accompanying context, but not in the minds of the parties. And this was quite deliberate because of the propensity of states to argue later that the treaties they signed did not mean what they seemed to mean because the states had not intended that meaning and states would trot out their sovereignty to say, how could the treaty mean something different from what we now tell you that it means because we, we made the treaty, you have to listen to us. Um, so intent is supposed to be inferred from the text of the treaty, uh, including from its object and purpose, but not from what states later argue about what their intent uh, was, unless, of course, you have two states actually agreeing in the form of subsequent agreement. Now, can you find similar principles in contract interpretation? Absolutely. There is a canon of construction of contract interpretation for almost every purpose. The objective meaning of written words trumps, although there is still a distressing number of references to the meeting of the minds in a large number of contract cases. Um, the contract provision should be interpreted in order to give other provisions in the agreement meaning. The contract should be interpreted in light of the circumstances in which it was made. The contract might be interpreted in light of trade usage and the expectations of those versed in the field, thereby somewhat broadening the context. Relational contract theory suggests that good faith can be set, uh, considered in long-term contracts. Um, there are underlying assumptions about commercial goals driving each of the parties and that they each, uh, certainly that we assume that they intended their contract to be binding. Yet will a contract interpreter necessarily employ those tools? Possibly, might or might not, they might or may not come up. Now the same could be said with the Vienna Convention on the Law of Treaties. The holistic directive is not always honored in practice. Um, and I think the flexibility in each of these doctrines suggests that the uh, selection of canons of construction and the manner in which they are employed uh, uh, and the decisions to which they lead really depend on who is doing the deciding and not necessarily on the, the means they employ to get there. What does that mean for BG Group? Uh, well, I think in BG Group there are two agreements at issue. First is the treaty and its provisions, and the second is the specific agreement to arbitrate the contract whose content was is informed by the terms of the treaty. Um, Article 8 is the investor state dispute settlement provision in the contract. Uh, the con dissent concluded, based on the language in the treaty and its view of Argentina's intent, that there was no agreement prior to the exhaustion or the 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 seeking of local remedies for 18 months. I confess I come to the opposite conclusion, looking at the same language and almost for a mirror image of what the, uh, uh, particularly what the dissent uh, thought. Um, the treaty is set up, it says that the dispute shall be submitted to domestic courts. Uh, and then section B says, if after 18 months there's no resolution or if that resolution is nonetheless unsatisfactory, then you can go to arbitration. I look at that in light of what I think of as the purpose of the treaty, which is to protect foreign investors and to promote uh, foreign investment. Um, and in light of the purpose of the investor state dispute settlement provision itself, which is to provide a neutral forum for the resolution of investment disputes, 
um, and uh, conclude, uh, you, you could say, when looking at the language, and, and then I look at the language of the treaty itself, and the, the dissent in BG group made a lot about the shall submit to domestic courts language, thinking that that meant you had to do that first, and what that meant was that was the, the, the first port of call, it was a requirement. I view that as a waiver of sovereign immunity that the state decided that it said that you can submit the dispute to local courts and we will not oppose that submission. So I think that's a, that's a different approach. Uh, it leads to a slightly different conclusion about the import of that language. Um, in the context, the provision provides that you can go to arbitration even if you have gone to local courts but are unhappy at the outcome, uh, unhappy with the outcome. Um, in other words, you, you can eventually get to arbitration. The question is how many steps you have to go through before you get there, um, which I you know, agree makes it look, I think, more like a house M issue. Um, you look at the purpose of the provision, the uh, dissent here in BG Group thought it conditioned Argentina's consent to investor state dispute settlement and thus viewed it as jurisdictional. I look at the purpose of the provision as encouraging the resort to local remedies prior to shifting course. Um, and I look at that in light of the broader agreement between Argentina and the United Kingdom in balancing uh, the protection of foreign investors against uh, sovereignty. Um, and I think in all of these cases, I'm looking at this, and I, I'm, I'm almost done, Trey, um, against the 18 month, uh, against the local remedies rule itself, which I think both the, the majority and the dissent refer to in BG Group. But this is a principle of in the uh, diplomatic protection context that you couldn't submit a claim, you, you, uh, that a state could not espouse a claim on behalf of its national until the national had exhausted local remedies. Um, now we could query whether this is relevant at all in the investor state arbitration context, but given the existence of that doctrine, uh, I would say that the, the treaty drafters could have required exhaustion but didn't. In other words, they could have had that as, an, as, a, as, a, as the condition that might have been really a condition to consent, whereas they chose this middle ground, which suggests that it was less uh, important. And I look at the development of the exhaustion of local remedies rule, which for many years was claimed to be substantive, that you simply had no wrong to redress until local remedies were exhausted. Um, others said that it was procedural, that it was only an impediment to the exercise of diplomatic protection, and thus it could be waived. The, um, uh, now, futility, the doctrine of futility could be applied in either of those contexts with this estoppel analogy. Uh, but the eventual conclusion has been that the exhaustion of local remedies rule is procedural merely. It's a, it's a step you have, to, a hurdle you have to get over. Um, so, you know, as an international lawyer, it, I analogize the procedural nature of the local remedies rule to the question of admissibility. It's not an outright impediment, but it is a procedural uh, step. Uh, you know, uh, just a kind of a closing point, the dissent suggests that it's hard to distinguish between the clear jurisdictional questions such as wh whether there is a, the, an investment, whether you have a covered investor, um, and the 18-month period, and conclude that that means the 18-month period should be encompassed in within those other questions, whereas it doesn't seem to me that it's that difficult to distinguish between the two at all, as the existence of an investor and an investment go to the scope of the treaty and the extent of its coverage, and the 18-month period goes to when the protected entity can uh, take uh, certain steps. Now, perhaps this is all angels dancing on the head of a pin if you take the estoppel argument seriously, because you might get to the same uh, point. Uh, but I suggest that the appropriate approach would be to use interpret the treaty uh, use that interpretation to inform the, uh, the content of the subsidiary contract, and to the extent U.S. law comes in, it is with respect uh, to the latter once the agreement to arbitrate uh, 
has been formed. Um, as for the treaty itself, and here's where I think I depart uh, from Jared's uh, conclusion, um, I absolutely agree with him that it seems unlikely to me that either the United States, or, I'm sorry, the United Kingdom or Argentina had any, made any decision con or had any conscious intent about delegation of authority to the arbitral tribunal to decide matters uh, of, of substantive arbitrability in addition to matters of procedural arbitrability. So it seems to me that the default rule here would be whatever the predominant international view is as to the review of those questions. Um, and I, I think the dominant view is that the, the reviewing authority can revisit the jurisdictional questions. And I, I think that's true even if you have an annulment committee under the ICSID convention because they can view whether there's been, an, they can too view wh whether there's been an excess of authority. And I'll stop there. Great, thank, thank you. you. As before, if there are questions, you can write them on the cards and pass them up. Um, but I figure before uh, either taking questions by cards, if there are any, just hold them up, someone will grab them. If not, we'll eventually get around to doing hands. Um, I wanted to, to, to sort of bring Jared back into the conversation, since you're a, a bit at odds in a way, both on reasoning and perhaps result, to, to, to get to the sort of punchline here, which is at one level, this is a question of who should decide. Is, is it the arbitrators that should decide this issue with substantial deference, as I take it from Jared on the part of, uh, of courts? Or is this akin to something like jurisdiction based on the international mm -hmm. standard, which would, regardless of what the arbitrators mm -hmm. say, would allow it to never review on the part of courts? And I wanted to see maybe if we could just talk about, about that for a second uh, under the sort of rubric of what's at stake and why does it matter? Mm. Um, Maybe I can try and answer that in a, in a slightly different way, which may not be satisfactory. But um, <laughs> I was just thinking, I'm not sure why it is the case that if we were to say that courts have to review it with deference, and this really may be a question of degree, why that doesn't count as review, mm -hmm. right? I mean, I'm not saying, in other words, that courts are precluded, uh, even under the approach that I'm advocating, uh, to to look at that decision, but that it must be done under a standard uh, that is deferential. Uh, and we, we might, at the end of the day, really be talking about to what degree of deference, mm. right? But obviously, when appellate court here reviews a question, it, there's a, there's a, it's always a question of what review standard should they employ. But whatever review standard they employ doesn't mean that they're not reviewing the decision. Um, and so I, I guess I'm, I'm wondering why the underlying assumption appears to be that if you're reviewing the decision or the award rather with deference that it means you're not reviewing it at all. Mm -hmm. Do you have any thoughts? Mm. No, I, I, you know, Jared, I, I think that is a good point. I, I've always been something of a skeptic of standard of review, standards of review as I think they're um, quite malleable and that courts manage to manage to find clear errors when they want to and manage to, you know, not find any, uh, any uh, problems at all when they don't want to. Uh, so, uh, you know, as far as, you know, as I said, maybe it is all angels dancing on the head of a pin. Uh, I, I suppose, the, but the, the bottom line is it's got to be easier if it's de novo review. Mm -hmm. Right, to, to come to a, a different conclusion, whereas if the arbitrator, if you're giving deference to what the arbitrator has chosen, you effectively have to say they got it wrong, which is you know, perhaps an extra impediment to saying we're making a judgment that somebody else got it, got it wrong. So that's, right, I mean, that's... Yeah. Yeah, let me and there may be an impediment to coming to that decision, even if you're still reviewing it. You may not oh, yeah, no, no, I, I don't decision. disagree that. I mean, that's the functional right. consequence of right. saying that one is reviewed de novo and one is, is not. Right. Um, but I, my sense is I that mean, the pushback against the position that it should be reviewed right. deferentially appears to be that it's not being reviewed at all, that there's, right. there are no circumstances under which the award <laughs> could be vacated. Uh, and I don't think that's true. 
so I just well, want to debunk that assumption, or at yeah. least call that to our attention. But, but, uh, can I, but I, I guess I'm not sure that, I mean, maybe it ought to be that way. I'm not sure it is that way. In other words, I think if it's entrusted in, if it's thrust into good. the admissibility rubric, it is virtually unreviewable. And so in that respect, there is, you know, yes, they can read it, but, you know, in that respect, they're reviewing it if you look at it from in very literal terms, but I think there's virtually no way to unseat it. Right. Well, and my thoughts so are that it, that a, should be the case, right? That only right. the most egregious violations, right, right should be addressed. Manifest uh, on, on, Right. Well, <laughs> huh. on, on, its, on its review. Right. Mm -hmm. Abby, what are, yeah. what are your thoughts on this issue, sort of as a practitioner, the sort of BG who decides what standard, what's the right approach, and then I, I actually have a follow-up also regarding ICSID, but let's continue with this for a second. Yeah, I mean, you know, from, from the practitioner's point of view, I mean, I think Depends you're, on which side you're on, right? Yeah, you're agnostic. <laughs> you're, you're agnostic because you don't know if you're going to win or lose, right. so, you know, the standard is what it is, and if you've lost, then you're happy for a, another bite at the apple, and if you've won, you want no review. So. I mean, I, I, I think it, it, it should be decided more from a policy point of view in the abstract. What do we want uh, to happen at the arbitration level as opposed to what type of control do we think we need to have uh, by the court? Uh, what, 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 what control is, is necessary and desirable? Um, and, 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 you know, in these distinctions, which are so nuanced between admissibility, procedural issues, and jurisdictional issues, you know, it's... It's, you know, from the point of view of, of the party, I'm not sure it matters too much, you know. I mean, right, right now I've got a case uh, before the French courts where, and it's an investment treaty case, and the French court is reviewing the jurisdictional decision de novo, and it's a treaty issue. Mm -hmm. uh, how awful. But it's the French courts, you know. So it's, the United States is not the only yeah. jurisdiction in which courts have a control, and, and this is because... There are different regimes. This goes back to the, 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 the significance of the ICSID regime uh, in which the control is another international panel that has a certain treaty standard of review as compared to UNCITRAL rules or any other type of arbitration rules where the control is the national courts. And I'll tell you that from a practitioner's point of view, I do sit down and have clients that have very big decisions to make. Are we going to go ICSID or UNCITRAL? A really big decision. And we discuss with them, well, you're going to eat, there's a very big significant difference. Are you going to have a national court control of the eventual award, or are you going to have another arbitration over whether or not you're going to have an annulment or not? And so these decisions, at least from the party point of view, you know, are, are really thought through. Yeah. Yeah. And it's complicated also in these cases because you have a foreign nation involved. Yes. Again, these are investor state. And, and one might argue that it makes some sense to afford U.S. courts more robust uh, scrutiny in order to protect the interests out of international comity of foreign sovereigns. Now, one could also make the yeah. argument the exact other way, too. That, 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 that that's in some ways what the Foreign Sovereign Immunities Act was designed to get rid of, well, those courts intermingling, but this yeah, is going to relate back to The Foreign Sovereign is agreeing to arbitration, mm -hmm. and, you know, famously now, there are a number of foreign sovereigns that are, you know, renouncing or den denouncing the, the ICSA Convention, and maybe that's not fully considered, but when they so say, I don't want ICSA Convention, and I'd rather have UNCITRAL rules, what that means is I would rather have a foreign court have a control over the arbitration that I've agreed to. So maybe that's because some of the politicians who are doing that are not thinking through mm. the consequences, but the fact is that's free choice of, of, of states. They're choosing a regime, uh, and there is a regime that exists to avoid the national court review. That's the ICSA convention, and states can insist that's what I want. So I, I, for one, don't see anything wrong with a national court control and nothing abhorrent about it. States agreed to it. That's the control mechanism. Mm -hmm. So, can I, can, yeah, I, I mean, I, you know, I, I agree. And I, you know, the, the doctrine in dubio mightiest that, 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 um, well, a treaty should be interpreted so as to, you know, honor state sovereignty has been completely debunked. So the whole notion that maybe that's another thing about the BG Group decision, oh, Argentina, sovereignty, Argentina, sovereignty. Well, that ship sailed, like with the SS Wimbledon, 
<laughs> Sorry. <laughs> um, so that's you know that's that's no longer the that is not the standard of treaty interpretation. Like treaties are you know in that respect, yes, treaties are interpreted like contracts. So, and, and I, I agree with Abby too about the. I, you know, maybe the confusion or, I mean, I think actually quite a lot of calculation about the states that have withdrawn from the ICSID convention or denounced the ICSID convention, most of them, might be one exception, maybe Bolivia, but they have not withdrawn from their investment treaties. And they, I, I, I mean, I view this as something of a, of a public relations exercise. We got to announce with great fanfare that we have no confidence in the system, such that, and so we're, we're denouncing the ICSID convention. Oh, but incidentally, we still have 85 investment treaties and we're still, you know, we're not actually withdrawing protections from foreign investors. So we get to have a lot of press about how we don't trust the system yet for individual investors, they know they can still go to Uncentral or yeah. you know wherever if they need to, and that, so I think that's a little bit of a talking out of those sides of their mouth. Yeah, uh, and by the way, I mean the ICSID review standards for annulment have yeah. it's a very very high standard, so yeah. it's not just excess of power; it's manifest that's excess, excess of, power. of power. And the other standards for annulment are equally quite high, so that it, that system is available for states to right. to select if that's really what they right. want. But there is still excess of power. You still gonna right? You know, but it's it's not it's not de novo. It's right. manifest excess right. of power, and and I can tell you that in in the practice that makes a difference. Yeah. Let's go. Uh, I don't have any cards yet, but I'm happy to open it up for. There's a card in the back. No. Someone could collect it. Also happy to open it up to questions, which I will repeat. <laughs> As we wait for a card. George. This was this is not something either of you addressed, but I've always worried about it in the DC uh, group case. Um, the Supreme Court took a position on the deference question, on the allocation question, but I have the impression that we don't have a ruling on the fundamental question of whether the arbitrators were right or wrong in their assessment. Uh, I must be missing something here, but the district court uh, said, um, yeah, they give we give deference. The Court of Appeal reversed and said, we don't give deference. And then the Supreme Court reversed and said, you know, you don't give deference. But who actually decided whether the futility argument that the arbitrators addressed was sound or unsound. Are, are you following what I'm, I'm, I mean, the arbitrators struggled with the question of whether the Argentine uh, closure, let's call it that, the Argentine closure of its courts rendered the exhaustion of remedies requirement futile. And they reached a decision on that that said it was futile. And there was no need to resort to that. Now, I've read three opinions in the Supreme in DC. I've read, I've read the a district court, court of appeals, and Supreme Court. And I don't understand when, if anywhere, the standard was applied. So briefly, that that was a, it's a long question, which I think makes sense. And I'll just restate it briefly. Were the arbitrators right? Uh, we've been focusing more on the standard for reviewing the arbitrator's decision, but George asked, asked the question at the end of the day, were the arbitrators right that it would have been futile to... Con to, or to more neutrally, whatever the standard, whether it's de novo or whether it's deferential, there's two things to decide here. What is the standard and how should it be applied? And I don't think we ever... Why didn't we ever get to the fact? I think it was decided impliedly. I mean, if I recall correctly, the district court had determined that the arbitrator's decision was colorable, if not reasonable, right? This not, I, I hope I'm not misquoting, but if that in fact is what the court decided, then it also decided that uh, under the uh, standard with deference, that that right, would not be touchable. In other words, it doesn't matter that it's incorrect or unreasonable um, because we are reviewing it with deference. So, I would presume that the Supreme Court in saying that that's the standard agreed, I think impliedly, that 
at, at worst, we can call this an unreasonable decision, but that would not clear right, the standard with deference. It's well, how I read it. Yeah. Because if the Supreme Court is saying this question requires de novo review. But they're who, not. Well, they're saying you don't, you don't defer to the arbitrators on this. You don't defer to the arbitrators on this. The arbitrators said futility. The district court said it was reasonable. No, the district court said it was unreasonable. No, the oh. position of the arbitrators oh. was reasonable. Uh -huh. Now we ultimately get to the Supreme Court, which says reasonableness is not the standard. It's de novo review. Alan, do you want to? I mean, I, I, I sort of position disagree. Right. But it seems to me that there, there are two questions here. To say that, and the first question is who sides, and the second question is whether indeed there was futility or for example. Uh, to say that the who decides question is for the court, when I think it is, it doesn't mean that the arbitration can't proceed. The court must do, if the court is the decision maker, the court must do its own futility uh, inquiry. And they probably would have come out the same way that the arbitrators did had they done it. Now, I think what the Supreme Court has done, in fact, uh, is um, uh, say that it is uh, uh, that the decision was for the arbitrators, yeah. therefore we're not going to yeah. the matter ends there. Whatever the arbitrator said about the utility. So there is a decision on the utility if we defer to the arbitrators on the utility. An alternative would have been to say, no, it's for the court to make the decision. If the court had made the decision, they would have probably come out the same way, uh, having done and made that inquiry, but they would have had to engage in the inquiry. But it's inherent in what the Supreme Court did that they don't have to engage in this. Right? Yeah. They're, they're, they're well, they would have had to affirm the district court's sense that it was reasonable. Yeah. Not if it wasn't no. raised in the circuit. Well, the it. only issue is the standard. Right. All they yeah. have to do is decide the standard and the application but of the, the standard argument court, decided. The district court's decision just stands on the, on the deference, application of the deference standard. There was no issue, and the court didn't have to do it. And the, yeah, and I would, you know, you said the, the arbitrator struggled with the question. <laughs> I think that might be a little kind. I'm not sure they struggled with it enough. I mean, I think. The district court struggled with the question. Yeah, but I not mean, the arbitrators, enough. I think, took it for granted that it wasn't that difficult a question. Professor Crow. That's right, yeah. Otherwise, they'd yeah. have had to remand. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's right. I actually see we're over our, well, actually, we are over, but I'm going to, since this is the, the first and only card we've had <laughs> all day, <laughs> you want to know what's on it, right? Absolutely. I want to know what's on it. Time is up, but question to Ms. Smutney. How does one enforce an exit award against a bond posted in the ICSID Secretariat as a condition of a stay pending annulment proceedings? And is a district court judgment required to recover a bond? If, it, if it's posted with the ICSID Secretariat? Well, the ICSID Secretariat is an international organization and it's going to be immune from, uh, your, the, you shouldn't have to do anything to enforce with the ICSID Secretariat. So if a bond is posted with the ICSID Secretariat, all you have to do is ask. Uh, is is the question is the answer <clears throat> because an international organization is going to be in entirely immune so there would be no national court that would ask the exit secretary to do anything so it, the, the the beauty of a bond posted with the exit secretariat is that it's you simply have to call on it if if the conditions are met for for doing so so that's why it's so desirable for the party seeking to enforce to have such security. And on a note of security, let's say thanks to our panelists. And we will adjourn <laughs> for 10-ish minutes for a break and then return here at 3 o'clock.